I know that I am hungry, but I'm not quite sure what I'm hungry for. Have any of you ever had that kind of experience before? I am hungry, but I'm not quite sure what I'm hungry for. Show of hands, how many of you have had that? Everybody in here has had that experience. You've been standing in front of your pantry, maybe kind of combing through the shelves, hoping to find that one thing that you just didn't know was in there. Or maybe you stood in front of the refrigerator with the doors open, right? Standing there, kind of silently staring in a haze, hoping that the right thing might jump off the shelf into your hand. Or especially maybe at a restaurant. This happens to me a lot, where you have a menu. There might be tons of things on the menu, and you read it over and over and over and over and over again because you just can't find the right thing. Now, it's not this, this kind of indecision that we have is not due to a lack of, of hunger. We might be quite hungry. We, we might be sitting around the table at the restaurant with our friends and family, and they might be able to hear our stomach rumbling as we're trying to make up our mind. It's not a lack of hunger that causes our indecision. We just can't find the right thing. We're not sure what we're hungry for. Now, when this happens to me, especially when it's at a restaurant, I am quick to ask for recommendations. Do we have folks who do that a lot? So I will ask the server who comes to me uh, what they maybe have had or what they like. I know some servers probably don't like that. It probably gets on their nerves a little bit. But, but my, my, uh, the way I go about that is, I, is my thought is that that server has got to know much more about this food than I do, especially a restaurant I might not have been to a lot before. They probably have tried more of those dishes, eaten more of those dishes than I have. Maybe they can maybe steer me in the right direction. Recently, I was very glad that I asked for a recommendation. I was at a meeting, a uh, lunch meeting, and as I was looking at the menu, there was a, a kind of a sandwich on there that I thought looked pretty interesting. I thought it might be good. And so when the server came, I asked him, I said, have you had this sandwich before? It looks good. I'm thinking about getting it. Is, is that a popular dish here? Do a lot of people get this kind of sandwich? And I was a little surprised that the server looked right in my face and said, no. No. He said, no, it's not popular. He says, in fact, at the, all the times I've worked here, I have never given that per, anybody that sandwich at all. No one ever gets that sandwich. It's kind of on there just to make it look good on the menu, make it look nice and, and rounded out, but no one actually eats it. So I was quite grateful for his honesty before I, I went the wrong way. He, he steered me into the right direction. And, th and that happens more often than not. The, the server, when I ask for a recommendation, will maybe steer me away from something that's not so good and will steer me towards something that will truly satisfy my hunger. In our scripture today, we will read about an individual who is hungry, but who is not quite sure what they are hungry for. In the book of John chapter 3, we find the story of Nicodemus, a Pharisee who visits Jesus under the cover of night because he has been impressed with all he has seen and heard from Jesus. These actions, these teachings, these healings have awakened a, a hunger within Nicodemus that perhaps he didn't even know he had. And so he visits Jesus seeking some information, perhaps a recommendation of how he might receive that which would truly satisfy his deepest hunger. Therefore, as we are in this season of Lent, and as we pay attention to the hunger that rumbles deep within us, let us hear this word together as it comes to us from John chapter 3. Hear the word of God. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. 
What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I say to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And then this Pharisee who was named who again? What's his, what's his name? Nicodemus. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered, you are a teacher of Israel, yet you do not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet we do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? Now listen to what Jesus says here about the Son of Man. He says, No one has ascended into heaven except the one who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now here's the payoff. Get ready. Verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of the Lord. It is appropriate that we might be talking about these themes of of fasting and hunger during this season of Lent. These are themes that we're going to revisit again and again throughout these weeks here in our worship services as we look at different scriptures. The practice of fasting has been used throughout the centuries by those who wish to refrain from satisfying their physical hunger in an effort to pay more attention to their spiritual needs. In our scripture just last week, we heard about Jesus fasting in the wilderness in order to prepare himself for his ministry, in order to draw closer to God. Now, not all of us here have probably engaged in the practice of fasting, but I'm certain that all of us here knows what it feels like to be hungry, for our stomachs to rumble because they are empty. I am also certain that we know what it feels like to experience a hunger that cannot be satisfied by food. This is an important question to ask ourselves here early in the season of Lent. What is it that you hunger for? As you examine your life, as you take stock of your innermost being, as you observe the world around you, what is it? That you hunger for. Now some of you may already know the answer to that question. You might could raise your hand this morning and articulate an answer. But I bet there are some of us here this morning. That might have a more difficult time doing that. Like what I spoke about when I began the, the sermon. I'm pretty sure there are plenty of us here today. That know that we are hungry for something. But we're just not sure what we are hungry for. As we read our scripture this morning, I believe our friend Nicodemus would fit into this category. As I said before, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a a member of the religious establishment. And we have all read stories about how the, the Pharisees were often furious when they heard Jesus teach or when they saw him perform healings. But Nicodemus was different. When he observed Jesus in action, it stirred something inside of him. The very first statement we read in our passage that that Nicodemus says to Jesus, and he shares his belief with him that, that he knows he could not do the things that he was doing if he was not somehow from God. Just like a, an appetizer at a, at a restaurant whets our appetites, Nicodemus' observations of Jesus awakens within him a hunger. A hunger that he didn't even know was there. And the pull of this this hunger on him, the pull of this hunger is so strong that that he has to go and ask Jesus about it. And so Nicodemus, he makes a risky move, a risky move at least for a Pharisee. He sneaks out to see Jesus under the cover of night to ask him for his recommendation. What might satisfy this newly discovered hunger? And Jesus tells him, 
just like a, a knowledgeable server, server at, a, at a restaurant. He, he invites Nicodemus to join him in this new kind of reality, a new way of being, one in which Jesus describes most often as the kingdom of God. He tells Nicodemus that in order to enter this kingdom, that one has to be totally transformed. One has to totally reorient their life. They have to be born into a brand new life, a life that is marked by water and spirit. In response to Jesus, Nicodemus asks a pretty good question, one that we might also ask when we hear the words of Jesus. Nicodemus asks, how can these things be? The Old Testament scripture we heard today also contains a, an appropriate and a related question. When the prophet Ezekiel is set before a valley, a valley that is filled with dry bones, God poses to him a question. Can these dry bones live? Now, of course, that seems like a question with a pretty easy answer. After all, how could life come from a valley that is filled with dry bones. Who would think that, that hope could, could be possible in a valley of destruction and devastation? Who would think that resurrection might be possible in a valley that is filled with nothing but death? Can these dry bones live? It's an important question not only for those prophets of old, but for us. It is a question that God not only directs to Ezekiel, but it is a question that God is asking of us. As we reflect on the landscape of our lives and of our world this morning, where is it that we see valleys of dry bones? Places where destruction and death seem to rule the day. Places where hope seems to be lacking. Unfortunately, these kinds of valleys can be found all around us. Just this week, we had an example of that. Our brothers and sisters in Nashville have seen these kinds of valleys as they experience the devastation as tornadoes ripped through their community. The opioid crisis that has touched so many lives of family and friends have forced many to see these kinds of valleys, valleys filled with dry bones. Each of us have seen these kinds of valleys every time we turn on the news and we see another act of mass violence and we know that it will not be the last one. However, valleys of dry bones are not just found on our TVs. We see them in our lives. Everyone who's gathered here knows that you have experienced hardship or heartache before. You know what it is to stand in those valleys, to stand there like the prophet Ezekiel, to look upon our own personal valleys that are filled with nothing but dry bones. Can these dry bones live? As we stand there pondering this question and surveying these valleys before us, we can often feel helpless. Doubtful that light may ever emerge from the darkness. Doubtful that life could break forth from death. However, even in the midst of our feelings of helplessness, even in the midst of our doubts, even in the midst of valleys of dry bones, there is something that stirs deep within us. Can these dry bones live? We desperately want to answer that question with a resounding yes. It is a, is a hunger that is deep within our souls, a hunger that is longing to be satisfied in the midst of the valleys of our lives and of this world. We are a people who hunger for healing. And if we read the rest of our Old Testament story, we would see that indeed God does bring healing and new life to this valley of dry bones. And as we have read our New Testament story today, we, we see that God promises healing and new life to all of creation through Jesus Christ. In the latter half of Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, he explains to this teacher of the law that the Son of Man will bring about healing and salvation to this world that God so loved. He references a, a story found in the Old Testament in Numbers 21 in which the people of Israel are plagued by poisonous snake bites. 
And God instructs Moses to create kind of a statue, a a bronze snake, to put it on a pole and to lift it up into the sky. And everyone who would look upon this bronze snake would be healed. In the same way, the Son of Man who will be lifted up on a cross will also bring healing. But not healing that is temporary, not just from a snake bite, not healing that is circumstantial, rather healing that is eternal. Friends, it is this kind of healing that we all hunger for. Healing that is foundational, healing that is transformational, healing that, healing that is fundamental, that changes the very fabric of our realities. This is the kind of healing we receive in Jesus Christ. This is what we prepare for during the season of Lent. This is what we celebrate in the sunlight of that Easter morning. So this day, May we give thanks for that which satisfies our deepest hunger. May we feast upon the hope found in our Savior Jesus Christ. May we be nourished so that we can endure every valley that comes our way, knowing that healing and new life are always possible with God. And most of all, may we not keep this good news to ourselves. Just like when we feast upon a good dish at a restaurant or in our home, may we share it with others. For the world around us also hungers for that which may truly satisfy. Amen.